So continuing with our schedule on DC Rebirth related content, Marvel, you know, I guess all new, all different Marvel, that kind of thing. What you guys will notice down in the description is that I've changed a couple things. And initially I had one day dedicated to, uh, to throwing things back, to doing some classic stories. But what I wanted to do is kind of extend this. So you'll basically see a classic DC story running alongside DC Rebirth and a classic Marvel story running alongside all new, all different Marvel. And the reason why is partially because I don't want to run out of content for all new, all different Marvel and DC Rebirth, but also because there's still some great stories to be told and so in addition to you know the son of superman and the whole you know return or i guess escape from dinosaur island what i want to do here is i want to dip my toe into the waters of superman earth one now we're not going to cover the entirety of this here simply because of the fact that superman earth one is unofficially divided into story arcs and because it's a graphic novel and it's so massive in size in order to make it digestible for you guys to be able to really pick up everything that's going on and for us to be able to have good explanations i'm going to take superman earth one in arcs and really just see whether or not people uh, people really seem to enjoy this and so again if you guys really like superman earth one uh leave a comment down below you know post a like you know hit the sub button and and let me know and if you guys really seem to enjoy it then we'll make this a weekly series until it's finished and then we'll transition to like batman earth one and super or i guess uh, wonder woman earth one and i think teen titans has an earth one series right now but again at this point uh you know for those of you guys who don't know or those of you guys who are familiar rather with the earth one series bear with me for a second while i run over this for those who aren't so within the dc universe uh there have been a lot of reboots, Crisis on Infinite Earths, uh, Infinite Crisis, Final Crisis, New 52, so on and so forth. And one of the big issues is that a lot of fans get wrapped around the origins of characters or they get tied into characters and it gets really uh, irritating and really daunting whenever reboots take place. The Earth-1 line of stories does not have this problem and the reason why is because the Earth-1 line of stories are considered wholly separate from everything going on in DC right now. So DC Rebirth does not impact Earth-1. Think of it as something completely and totally isolated. Isolated. And the reason why this is so cool is because it allows DC to do whatever they want to with Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, so on and so forth, all the characters who will appear as part of the Earth-1 series. It gives them absolute freedom to craft their stories however they want to. And with Superman Earth-1, of course, because Superman is a flagship character of DC, J. Michael Straczynski kicked off the entire Earth-1 premise using the character of Superman. Now, getting into this, one of the things that I love so much about J. Michael Straczynski's writing is he focuses so much on character development. A lot of people will look at, you know, Spider-Man One More Day and they will say this is, it's, it's just one of the worst things to ever happen because it retconned, you know, one of the most significant marriages in the history of comic books. But when you get past the premise of the story and you look at the writing of J. Michael Straczynski, it's fantastic. And he's like that every single time. When he wrote Silver Surfer Requiem, it was amazing writing. He hits the mark every single time. And with Superman, it's, it's exactly the same. You know, there's no difference here. Initially, we pick up with Clark Kent uh, boarding a train to to Metropolis. And again, because this is Earth-1, this deals with the early days of his character. Now, the cool thing about this is that Superman's origin is timeless, right? I mean, from the time he first showed up in Action Comics in 1938, from, you know, the time that humanity collapses, the origin of Superman will be known. People will know that he's the son of, the last son of Krypton, that he was sent home, you know, sent away from a dying world. He landed on Earth, he was adopted by the Kents, he was raised, and he eventually became Superman. It's a timeless tale. What Straczynski does is he does not not take the Batman approach here. Batman's origin is actually tied in almost immediately with the beginning of Batman Earth One. With Straczynski, he takes us through, you know, the early days of Clark Kent's life and then wrap back, uh, wraps back around with the origin story at the end of this first arc. And what he tells us here is that when Superman, or I guess right now when Clark Kent arrives in Metropolis, it's really about finding his way. Of course, he takes up residence in the Metropolis Hotel and his an entire, you know, discussion with his mother is that for him, he just wants to find his way in the world. He wants to find his place in the world. Now, the reason why I say this is so important, the reason why I say Straczynski is so good at paying attention to character is for Superman, and this is one of the things that I love so much about his character, for Superman, Earth is not his home, and it never was. You know, Earth, no matter what happens with Superman, whether it's Superman 1 million, where he becomes part of the sun, he goes, you know, into the source, and he has all these huge experiences, at the end of the day, Krypton is his home, but it's a home he can never return to. There's family there that he will never be able to see, and so for him, him trying to make his way on Earth is basically Superman just trying to make it day by day. He's trying to fit in as best he can. And that's one of the things that I always say with the character of Superman. He looks at Earth and he's, he cannot say, this is my home. All he can say is, this is where I'm needed. He'll never be able to say, this is where I belong. And so I, I think that's one of the cool concepts with him. But again, you know, when he arrives here, when Clark Kent arrives in Metropolis, he's really just kind of 
checking out the area. He's just kind of poking around. And for him, it's getting a lay of the land. You know, it's really coming to an understanding of what Metropolis is about. It's the, the small town kid moving to the big city. You know, the person from some small town ranch in, you know, North Carolina moving to Los Angeles. You know, it's, it's learning everything that goes on. But because of the moral compass that was taught to him, you know, by Ma and Pa Kent, to be quite honest, you know, he also understands the value of what it means to contribute to society and to be the good guy. Now, of course, as we would expect, you know, someone walking down a dark alley in the middle of the night, uh, he's held at gunpoint by some criminal and he uses his heat vision to basically uh, incinerate the gun and to send the guy fleeing for his life. You know, not only that, you know, the guy initially uh, has the idea of killing him, but we also know that if this were to happen, the, the dude would probably be incinerated. So again, he basically just flees. And so we also get this continuation of Clark Kent trying to find his place in the world and we pick up with him trying out for a football team. And this is one of the things that I really, really liked here because we know with super strength, with the ability to fly, he can run super fast. You know, sometimes he's faster than the Flash. It depends on what story you're talking about and when that story was written. The idea is he would easily become a member of this football team. And that's what happens here. You know, the, the coach is uh, is looking at, you know, Clark Kent and he's a little disappointed. And the reason why is because, you know, when he was informed that Clark Kent was a, a very capable football player, when he was able to play everything, you know, when he was able to play offense, defense, you know, the wide receiver, the safety, the tackle, quarterback, halfback, linebacker, basically all the key positions that he expected Clark Kent to be a massive guy. But Clark Kent's just some really small, scrawny dude. But the idea of the coach is, hey, you're here. We might as well see what it is that you're capable of. And Clark shows it in spectacular fashion. And this is this is kind of a funny thing because, you know, with, with other writers, we may have seen an instance where they just glossed over this, or maybe Clark Kent was just blending in. And so he allowed himself to easily be taken out. But instead, he doesn't do that. You know, he lines up against the biggest linebacker they have, you know, the biggest defensive lineman they have, and he plows right through him. He catches the ball with the greatest of ease. You know, when it comes to being wide receiver, it's the exact same thing. You know, he just goes through. There was even one point where the coach simply says, you know, everybody on, on the offensive line, you know, sandbag yourself. Just let the defense run through and uh, let them all tackle Clark Kent and let's see what happens. They all try to tackle Clark Kent and he runs through all of them. And so because of this, the coach is absolutely flabbergasted, but realizes that someone like this on their football team is a guaranteed win. And so he has one of the guys grab a contract, bring it down, and they are willing to agree to pay him whatever it is that he's willing to take. Now, from here, we shift over to a science lab. And, and I'll, I'll kind of, you know, uh, you know, make all this clear here in a minute as to why Straczynski is doing this. But we jump forward to a science lab. And within the science lab, uh, we're told by the, the person who's in charge of it all that this is an extremely difficult lab to get into that is tantamount to the financial sector and CFA. So those of you guys who don't know certified financial accountants, uh, you got to go through three CFA tests to work on Wall Street. You know, they're progressively harder. They're given uh, once a year, I think. Uh, to give you some perspective, a friend of mine graduated college with a master's in finance, and he spent a year and a half studying for the first CFA. He spent another year and a half studying for the second and failed. So they're extremely difficult tests to take. But with this, we're told the exact same thing, that this institute only takes the top five graduates from, you know, from any of the best universities, from Harvard, from Yale, from Princeton. And that's the top five combined. You know, that's, that's not, you know, five from each school. It's five total, just to show you how difficult it is to get into this institution. But what we're told here is that Clark Kent has approached this place for the purpose of, of securing employment. And initially this guy's response is that's preposterous. You know, not only are you, do you not even go through the normal channels to do this, but even those individuals that we select spend four years before they can even go into research and development. You know, they basically undergo four years of training before they do anything real with regards to our company. And so Clark Kent, you know, he asked the question, what are these guys working? on right now. The guys are on the other side of that wall. What are they working on? And the guy says, well, they're working on deriving electricity from salt water. And so Clark Kent just writes up a formula and says, go give it to him. And the guy's initial response is, look, man, we don't have time for, for games. And Clark says, look, if you give them this formula, I will walk away and, you know, I will, I'll, I'll get out of your hair. And it's hilarious because they take the formula, you know, the guy takes the formula over to the scientists and they immediately have the answer. <laughs> and it's funny because they've been working on that formula for about three years. They've been working on how to try, you know, they've been working on figuring out how to derive electricity from salt water in three years. Clark Kent shows up on their doorstep and gives it to them. And, and so, you know, this guy comes back and says, hey, look, whatever you do, do not leave this spot. You know, uh, I'm going to make a few phone calls. Now, the reason why I said that I would wrap around, you know, with this, with regards to what Straczynski's doing, is he's showing us what Superman is capable of. And again, this is all really leading up to Superman becoming Clark Kent, you know, and it's going to be a really funny situation because with regards to all these things that he's doing, I mean, one, you know, his Superman uniform, his 
luggage is just sitting in a closet. The iconic uniform that will stand the test of time as one of the most recognizable symbols in the history of the human race right now, you, me, the people who lived before us, the ones who will come after us, it'll be one of the most recognizable symbols for, you know, till the end of time. And it's just sitting in a closet because Clark Kent doesn't think anything of it. You know, for him, it's just clothes. It's just the remnants of his life when he was in Smallville. And so again, Straczynski tells us that he's been offered all manner of positions. He's been offered jobs as one of the best scientists. He's been offered jobs working on Wall Street, you know, being a professional baseball player, you know, working as a, uh, I guess, as one of the guys in charge in a construction site. But none of these make him happy. And that is the distinctive difference. That's the big difference here. The reason why Straczynski is so good when it comes to writing character is he focuses on the character. Superman could have been in any one of these things. And for, for Straczynski, you know, with Earth One having so much freedom and so much lay, uh, leeway on what it is that he could and could not do. He could have made Clark Kent a construction worker and said, well, in this reality, he's a construction worker and that's just the way it is. But no, he ties into the history of Clark Kent going to work for the Daily Planet. The difference with this is he gives us a reason why. It's not because he just wanted to be a reporter. It's not because he always wanted to be a reporter. It's because he was going through and he was trying to find his way within the city of Metropolis. And he comes across an article that simply reads City Hall Scandal. And he takes the article out and he starts reading or at least he buys the newspaper and he starts reading it and he starts going through you know everything that's going on with regards to the daily planet and eventually he travels to meet perry white for and you know for a resume that he submitted and a job interview now at the same time we also see that we encounter lois lane for the very first time now this is also a pretty funny situation here because we would expect this to be you know love at first sight you know because with regards to the whole superman mythos almost always superman and lois lane are are the power couple. I mean, Lois Lane is the first lady of comics. She's the quintessential damsel in distress. You know, with the exception of the New 52, we've never seen an instance when it hasn't been Clark Kent and Lois Lane, you know, the one-two punch of DC Comics. But the issue with this is that because Straczynski's taking a different approach, it's, they're not immediately smitten with each other. It's not as though Lois Lane is like, oh my God, you know, Clark, you know, Clark Kent, you're the most attractive guy I've ever met, but he's smitten with her. You know, he's, he's really attracted to her. Now, maybe it's because of, of her confidence, maybe it's because of the fact that she's intelligent, but whatever the reason is, it doesn't really seem reciprocated. Now, this is basically J. Michael Straczynski tying back to the original Superman mythos. And what I mean is when Superman first appeared in Action Comics, of course, Lois Lane was there. But, you know, if you go and watch any interview with Siegel and Schuster, they'll tell you that the original intention was to have Lois Lane absolutely despise, you know, Clark Kent in the beginning and be in love with Superman. And then eventually that would change. She wouldn't necessarily learn his identity, but she would learn to become more respecting of, uh, of Clark Kent and they would have a very close friendship with one another, at least as close of friends they can get without, you know, Clark Kent telling her that he's Superman. Now, we know in the post-crisis continuity, we know that much later on, you know, going into the uh, end of the 90s, the Superman revealed his identity to Lois Lane for the very first time, which was a very big deal when that happened. But the fact remains here, you know, that, that Straczynski's not just giving us this, you know, this archetypical story of, you know, boy meets girl, boy and girl fall in love and they live happily ever after. He's giving us real character development here. He's giving us real indication of who these people are. And so after going Going through what it is that uh that you know i guess going through clark kent's uh resume one of the funny things that perry white says here is that because of the internet everybody with a keyboard a mouse and a blog thinks they're a good writer they you know they think they know how to write good material and he says that clark kent's writing is decent enough but he writes like he's holding something back now we know that that's clark kent just not revealing to the world that he's superman but this is j michael Straczynski telling us that you know clark kent refusing to reveal his identity to the world holds him back on a personal level because he can't truly be who he is, you know, that he has to be a fake character. I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to quote uh, Kill Bill, the Superman monologue, because I've, I've got this thing memorized. For those of you guys who never saw Kill Bill Volume 2, there was a great segment where he started talking about Superman and he said a staple of the superhero mythology is that there's a superhero and there's the alter ego. Batman is really Bruce Wayne. Spider-Man is Peter Parker. When that character goes to sleep at night, he's Peter Parker. He has to put on a costume to become Spider-Man, and it's in that characteristic that Superman stands alone. Superman didn't become Superman. Superman was born Superman. When he gets up in the morning, he's Superman. His alter ego is Clark Kent. And what are the attributes? The outfit with the big red S. That's what he was wearing when the Kents found him. Those are his clothes. The glasses and business suit, that's the costume. That's the costume Superman wears to blend in with us. Clark Kent 
is how Superman views us. And what are the characteristics of Clark Kent? He's weak. He's unsure of himself. He's a coward. Clark Kent is Superman's critique of the whole human race. Now, the reason why I ran off that quote is because that's exactly what Straczynski is building on here. That's what he's telling us here. That Clark Kent is, is how Superman sees the world. He's how Superman sees humanity. And because of this, he has to hold himself back. He cannot be someone to aspire to when he's Clark Kent. He has to be an everyday person. And because of that, it presents a scenario whereby he can't fully be himself. He can't fully write, you know, in a way that gives people something to look up to. He has to write the same way everybody else writes. He has to write the world through their eyes. Now, with regards to him stepping into the role of becoming Superman, what Straczynski does here is he, again, kind of gives Clark Kent an existential crisis in the sense that, you know, he takes a second to sort of jump back to the origin story. Now, we don't get the full origin story here because again, like I said, you know, it's, it's timeless. We don't, you know, we don't really need to be told that Superman was shot away from a dying planet. We know that. What we care about is what happens next. How good is the storytelling when he gets to Earth? And that's what we as Superman fans care about. And that's what Straczynski gives us. What he does is he flashes back to the first time that Superman asked his parents who he is, why he's here, where he came from. Now, what they say initially is that they don't know. They don't know the answers to those questions. You know, they don't know why he was here. They don't know where he came from. All they knew is that the two of them were just hiking in the woods one day. And suddenly there was a sonic boom and there was a rocket ship that crash landed onto Earth. Now, this is a little bit different from what we're used to. In some Superman stories, I think in the New 52, they stuck with the idea that, um, you know, the two of them were basically driving down the road. If we read Superman American Alien, we pick up with Max Landis saying that, uh, you know, basically Ma and Pa Kent, they, they had a child before, but that child passed away. Uh, there have been some instances where they just can't have kids, you know, but for whatever reason, they end up adop adopting Clark Kent. This is just another instance where we see something a little bit different, you know, where the two of them are uh, are hiking, you know, and Martha and Jonathan stumble across, you know, Clark Kent's body, or I'm sorry, his, uh, his rocket ship, and immediately take him and, uh, and basically adopt him. Now, for them, the idea is, you know, once the government starts setting in, you know, once the, the Fed starts to ask the question of, you know, what's this rocket ship, where did it come from, they immediately take Clark Kent and they adopt him as their own. Jonathan Kent also says is that he was meant for something special, that the things that he's able to do, the powers that he possesses, make him somebody that's that's destined to do something great. But the problem with this is they just don't know what that is. They're like any parent in any situation when any child sits down and says, why am I here? What's, what's the point of me being here? It's the quintessential answer of, we don't know. All we can do is guide you the best we can and hope that you turn out as great as we believe you are. Now, what we also do is we get some perception of the fact that not everything was rosy for Clark Kent. It's really only on a page or so, but it's the idea that he is, that he's picked on, that he's made fun of by kids at school. But he basically references what it is that he was told by Jonathan that you can't let your powers get the better of you. You can't just lash out. You can't let other people, you know, control your actions. That you literally have to keep things contained because if someone angers you and you punch them, you will kill them with your strength. And so you have to basically just let things roll off of you. Now, this is an important lesson that we learn in everyday life. You know, I mean, if, if everything everybody says bothered everybody else, well, the world just couldn't function. You know, like you just have to recognize that there are some people in this world who are just miserable, that their life sucks for whatever reason. And the only way for them to find happiness is to try to make other people miserable. Then that's how this guy is. That's how this bully is. You know, like this bully is probably living a life that sucks, you know, and the only way that bully can be happy is to try to make Clark Kent miserable. But whatever the reason is behind it, we basically kind of jump back, you know, to the present day with uh, with Clark Kent traveling to a church and to the, uh, to the grave of Jonathan Kent. And he sits down and he has this great heart-to-heart -heart conversation with his dead father. You know, Jonathan can't, can't respond. You know, he doesn't say anything. It's really just, you know, Clark talking to himself, really as much as he's talking to his dad. And he says that, you know, he's sorry for coming by so late that he always knew his father was a morning person, but that he just wanted to talk to him. And what he says is that he doesn't think he can be a superhero. He doesn't think that he can be a man 
that can live up to saving the world. Now, this is why this is so great, because we always assumed that Clark Kent would move to Metropolis. We would assume that he would see how bad the world is from time to time, and he would see Metropolis as a city he can save. He would don his Superman costume. He would reveal his eye, you know, reveal the fact that he's Superman to the world. People would look up to him as something to celebrate, and he would be the savior. What Straczynski tells us here is that was not the case, at least not in Earth One, that Superman didn't believe that he could do that due to his experiences in being picked on, due to the fact that the world is simply not ready for someone like him, that he doesn't think that he can be Superman because he believes that if he reveals his identity to the world, if he shows the world that he has powers, he'll constantly be on the run from people that want to kill him, he'll be on the run from the governments that want to capture him, from private companies that want to capture him and use him for their own ends. He doesn't believe that humanity is ready. And this is, again, a great reflection of how it is that Clark Kent views the world. And so what he says is that he really wishes that his dad was here to give him some advice. But he also says that he recognizes the valuable lessons that his father taught him. And so essentially he says that he's going to go about and live his life as best he can. But at this moment right now, he doesn't believe he will be able to take on the mantle of being a Superman because he doesn't think the world is ready for it yet. But with that being said, we're going to go ahead and wrap up this first story arc. I really hope you guys enjoyed it because I got to tell you like Earth One, you know, the Earth One line of stories, some of the best damn comic book reading you're ever going to have in your life. <laughs> Jeff Johns, uh, Batman, I think I think Jeff Johns wrote uh, wrote Batman Earth One is so good. And like the Earth One stories are amazing. If you guys like, if you guys have read Earth One and you guys enjoy it, post a comment down below. Just be like, Earth One is amazing. You know, but if you guys are new here to uh, to Comics Explained, you guys want to see more uh, Earth One line of stories, then make sure you guys uh, drop a like, make sure you guys hit the sub button. And uh, yeah, leave a comment down below. Let me know what you guys think. And I will catch you all later. Peace.